I am 530. Uh, Holly, uh, I'd like to convene this meeting of the Board of Directors for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for February 16th, 2023. Holly, would you take roll, please? President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Ackerman. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. Um, District Manager, are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? Uh, yes, uh, I would like to remove item uh, A, the public employee's annual performance evaluation from the closed session agenda. Okay. Um, okay. Um, oral communications uh, regarding items in the closed session. I see no one from the public um, in attendance. So I think we can move um, beyond that. Yes. Okay. Um, well, given that, I'd like to adjourn to the closed session then. And we will see you there. Oh, yes, six thirty. <laughs> we will get information from Holly at a later point as to the list of movies. I'll so, try to remember. Um, I'd like to convene this meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District uh, for February sixteenth, twenty twenty-three. Uh, Holly, would you take roll? Please? President Smalley. Here. Vice President Hill. Here. Director Ackerman. Here. Director Fulz. Here. Director Mayhood. Here. Um, Rick, are there any additions or deletions? Uh, staff has none, Chair. Open session. Staff has none. Okay. Okay. Um, oral communications. This is for the uh, this portion of the meeting is for the public to bring up any items that are not on the agenda for this evening. Uh, does anybody from the public have anything that they want to bring up? Um, I see that uh, Jim Mosier has his hand up. So, Jim. Can <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I had a quick question. I've, I've been very curious about what the next steps will be about replacing that pipeline, whether we're going to put it underground or not. And I, I just thought we would have had a next step by now since it was since we've had the two opinions. So I just wondered when the board and the staff is going to let the public know what's going on with that decision. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Uh, since this is not on our agenda, we can't discuss that this evening, but I think it would be appropriate, Rick, for you to bring that back at a subsequent one. Yes, and, and we're getting close to coming back to the board with okay. that project. Okay, good. Thank you then. Um, moving on then to the president's report. I have none this evening. Um, Rick, uh, moving to unfinished business. The first item is the Big Basin Water Company. Yes, this will be a joint presentation, and I'll let I'll let Gina kick it off. Uh, District Council kick this item off to the board. Gina, thank you, Mark and Rick. I was asked to co-present this item with Rick. Um, because of our status as the designated co-negotiators for the district in connection with Big Basin Water Company, uh, potential consolidation. Uh, and of course, the board will recall that in uh, November of 2021, 
roughly 18 months ago, uh, you, the board, direct authorized the district manager to explore the possibility of consolidation with Big Basin uh, following its extensive damage in the CVU wildfire. At, at that time, you authorized the district to expend limited resources to explore feasibility, um, including various barriers such as legal barriers to consolidation and to determine in particular if consolidation could be accomplished without the district uh, without the cost being borne by the district's existing customers. Um, we have since that time, well, I should say the district staff has since that time been evaluating uh, the state of the Big Basin Water Company facilities and the costs that it would entail to bring the system into compliance with state water quality regulations. Um, in August of this past year, just about six months ago, the board formally designated uh, Rick and myself as the district's negotiators and we and other representatives of the district have in that in that capacity have participated in, in a number of meetings with stakeholders including the owners of big basin water company uh, the puc the state water board and the county and despite these these fairly extensive efforts um, we as the negotiators and staff have not been able to identify a path forward for consolidation that, that protects the existing district customers from absorbing the cost of consolidation, which may be substantial. And, and there's um, additional information about um, those potential costs presented in the background section of the memo, and, and Rick may want to discuss a little further as well. But I'm just going to state the staff's recommendation before turning it back to Rick, um, and that is that the board by motion direct the district manager and staff to suspend efforts to evaluate a potential consolidation with the Basin Water Company and de-designate the district manager and myself as negotiators. Okay, thank you, Gina. Rick, do you have anything to add? Yeah. I think district council laid this out pretty well. Um, and as the memo stated, uh, we do not see a, a path forward at this time. And this would also um, uh, sunset the district's uh, emergency and uh, other support that we have been giving uh, Big Basin. Okay, thank you for that, Rick. Um, I'd also like to uh, recognize that the board did receive a letter from um, County Supervisor Bruce McPherson um, that um, expressed the county's viewpoints on this. They recognized that uh, San Lorenzo Valley Water District has put uh, considerable efforts into us, thank us for those um, efforts. County also indicated that they have spent considerable amount of time on this, um, but they are no farther along um, in, able, in getting to any kind of a solution or seeing anything from the state on that. So uh, with that said, I also wanted to reflect, um, as a board member, I participated as the board's representative in a number of the discussions with both uh, county and state, uh, starting in about December of 2021. Uh, and since that time, I have, not been able to hear anything from the state um, as to a viable path forward financially that they could provide to the district uh, on how this consolidation might happen. So with that, uh, before we go out to the public to hear any comments, I'd like to hear uh, from members of the board on any comments that they have regarding this or questions. Um, start with Bob. Um, just a quick follow up. Um, our efforts with uh, Bracken Bray and Forest Springs will continue um, unabated and unaffected, correct? That is that correct. Is correct. I think that's very important to make sure we we let that be known. And in those cases, we do um, at least there's there is uh, a funding path. That, that we can see to support those efforts. And so um, it's not like we're 
saying we're going to do nothing in the wake of the fire, but but there is um, uh, financial issues around big basin water. I mean, before the election, the recent election, during the election, and after the election, I've made it very clear to the people that uh, of our community that I did not support investing um, uh, district resources, their money into this effort uh, without there being a funding mechanism for this from the state, the feds, county, somebody. Um, and I'm consistent in that position. I don't expect to change that position um, you know, for any reason going forward. Um, th this has to be resolved in a way that um, does not put our district uh, constituent communities on the hook for, for funding. I did have one other question, uh, Rick, with respect to cutting off the emergency support that we've been given. Would that also include, for example, the water filling station that we put up periodically when Big Basin Water does have issues um, supplying water? I would not recommend taking that down. Um, it's very little expense to the district and it is a, a vital water supply um, uh, to those folks. Um, I do believe that they're back in potable water, so we will take it down, but we wouldn't hesitate to put that back up. Well, that's exactly what I want to hear because um, I think it's, you know, water is life and, and we're going to continue to be good neighbors in that respect. Um, and and we've, we've done so, I think, right from the beginning. So um, people can, can count on us for that too. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bob. Gail? Um, yeah, I would echo many of the things that Bob said, and it's, it's regrettable that we're in this circumstances where we haven't been able to elicit from the state um, some uh, commitments that would make it possible for us to move forward. And I think it's right that we um, adopt the motion that's here because I know that the staff has been spending a lot of time um, evaluating things. Um, we've been spending um, the time of our legal counsel, which, you know, all these things um, cost us money and distract us from uh, our other activities. And um, yet there's been no progress. And so there, there has to come a point at which we say that's enough. It's in the uh, all court of the state and other agencies and that we simply cannot be the backstop for um, Big Basin Water Company anymore. Thank you, Gil. Uh, Jeff? So I'm the, the newcomer on this issue here, but I think it's important that everyone understands that our district has had a number of mergers and consolidations over the recent history, but every one of those has had either the rate payers of the group that was joining us, uh, taking on financial commitments or uh, grants of one form or another from other government agencies. And, and uh, those were all funded externally from, from our district. And I think that's important to understand. So uh, I also am in favor of this uh, motion. Okay, uh, Jamie? Um, I'm not going to surprise anyone when I say I'm also in favor. Um, I, I just want to say, um, for the record, I don't think, um, I, you know, there are very many big basin water customers, um, that are on the call, uh, today, but even though this is, uh, you know, the end of our, um, ongoing process to try and find a path to consolidation I, you know as a as a resident of the valley i remain open to helping support on a personal basis any you know needs they may have in terms of you know outreach or engagement or thoughts about you know how they might continue to make their case to the various um, authorities that will be able to um, help with this. So I just, you know, want to say that to any residents who might um, be watching right now or might uh, might tune in and watch this later. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, now we'd like to hear any questions 
uh, from members of the public. Before we go out to that, I'd like to get a sense of the number of individuals that want to um, ask questions or speak on this subject. If you could use the uh, raise hand function um, so that we could see that. Okay. Um, seeing one only. Uh, any questions that come up uh, from either Jim Mosier or subsequent ones we'd like to address at the end uh, of the discussion. So, uh, Jim, go ahead with your questions. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Um, I don't actually have a question. I was expecting there'd be a fair number of people from from the big basin to be here and, and talk. I just want to express, as Jamie did, as a citizen of the Valley, I would really like to help those folks up there um, deal with this problem. And I totally agree with what the board has indicated they're going to take in the staff that we have to step out. And hopefully by us stepping out of the process, it might put a little more pressure on the county and state to actually get engaged here because um, it, it, this is just really um, unacceptable to let these to to leave these people in this situation. And you know, it's there's a lot of responsibility to spread around, but I feel like the district has done everything reasonable to try to be a, a positive neighbor. And I and it just makes me sad. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Um. Seeing no other uh, commenters from the public, uh, we have a motion in front of us um, as read by uh, District Council Nichols to direct the district manager and staff to suspend efforts um, on evaluating the potential consolidation. Um, I would like to make that motion. Second. Okay, Holly, can you take a vote on this? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackerman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Mayhood? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next item, uh, the Fall Creek uh, Fish Ladder Rehabilitation Project. Yes, uh, the district engineer will uh, present this project uh, to the board. Josh. Thank you, Rick. This one's fairly straightforward. We put the Fall Creek Fish Ladder Rehabilitation Project back out to bid. We received two bids uh, from McGuire and Hester and Sibling Reed Construction. Siblin Reed was low at just shy of 2.4 million. And staff recommends that the district award to Siblin Reed and have provided a recommended motion. With that, I'll take questions. Okay. All right. Um, questions from the board. Uh, Gail? I don't have any questions. Okay. Uh, Jamie? No, neither do I. All right, Jeff. One question. Um, we have two bids. Um, how many did we go out for? How many companies did we ask? I directly emailed over 25, almost 30, and made contact with a couple others via phone or folks that I ran into in other situations. So we have been scouring the landscape, trying to get more bids on this. Is Any it, reason you would care to, to uh, speculate on why we out of all those contractors, only two bid on this? I think that the compressed time frame scared a bunch of people off because of the or the Department of Fish and Wildlife requirement that work within the stream be completed between June 15th and October 15th. 
And I think that the access to the site being as limited as it is, and some of the challenges about how it's going to have to be built are scaring off some of the others. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bob? Yeah, so I mean, it's an incredibly specialized task. And, um, you know, even even more so with with everything around it. So I, you know, while I'm disappointed that we only got two, I am happy that we got somebody with whom we're not familiar with. I mean, as you know, Josh, I'm very interested in expanding the um, portfolio of companies that we've worked with that may in the future um, want to continue working with us and continue bidding on things um, because we do have a lot of work that we have to do. Uh, so thank you for your efforts in, in getting that. I had one other question, which was, at one point in time, I think we had a grant to cover part of the cost of this. Is that um, is that grant gone, or is that grant still available to us? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's still available. Uh, Rick would know better than I. And how much is that grant? Um, Carly, uh, do you want to uh, give a, a, an amount of the grant? Sure. It's a million dollars uh, that we have towards the project. So we're on the hook for 1.3. Plus, yeah, plus a little more for uh, project management. Yep. And um, Rick, in terms of the um, uh, the 2019 COP, um, how are we doing on that relative to what we are spending on the Lion pipe and now this? Are we still okay? Or are we going to have to dip into other funds? I, I do believe we're still okay. Um, we still need to come back to the board with uh, a modification, an amendment to the resolution because we pulled one of the projects and we yes, do we have a million dollar grant on this. Um, and we need to factor in the FEMA money for the lion. So we'll first, we'll bring uh, an update on the on those projects to the budget committee and then to the board. Including the, um, including an update on the numbers and where we are with that yeah, 14 correct. million. Yeah, correct. Okay, that would be really great. I'd like to, I'd like to see that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, um, and, and I'm Josh, I'm glad you checked them out. Um, uh, given that they are new, so so that's great. Let's let's do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, two things that I wanted to bring up regarding uh, Slybon Reed's uh, bid. Uh, I looked at their project experience sheets, and to me, they were impressive. Uh, the project experience that they provided to us uh, were for fish ladders. Um, some of them ranging up to seven and eight million. So they were interested in this project because they have experience in this type of work. That's great to have a contractor that um, I hope knows what they're doing with this. And from the project description sheets, I believe that they do. So Josh, good job in getting a hold of somebody like this um, and getting a bid from them. Um, the question that I have is on their overtime. Um, we asked the question about can they do the work uh, in standard hours? They said no, they want to work up to 10 hours a day and some Saturdays. I don't expect that 10 hours a day are going to be an issue. Uh, will Saturdays, given the fact that they're in a, a neighborhood, do we anticipate? Or is that not likely. I, I don't anticipate there being a large difficulty. It will require some additional time spent largely by myself and the engineering staff in some PR work in making sure that the folks who live in that area live on Fall Creek and to a lesser extent on Farmer across the bridge are right. aware of what's going on and have a good picture of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how long it's going to take us. Okay, good. Okay, um, before we go out to the public, I'd like to put the motion on the table then. Um, 
we direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Slybon Reed Construction for the construction of the Fall Creek Fish Ladder Rehabilitation Project in the amount of $2,365,720. I second. Not a penny more. <laughs> okay, thank you for that, Bob. Um, Wait, is that legally binding? Because we might. <laughs> oh, um, I think that was tongue in cheek. Uh, very much. So motion uh, I the one that was in the packet. The motion as read. Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, with that motion, do we have any comments? Uh, from the members of the public on this? I see none. Uh, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Mayhood. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, moving on to new business. Um, first item is the policy for the return to in-person board and committee meetings. Uh, we will uh, ask district council to uh, present this to uh, the board. Okay, thanks Mark and Rick. Um, I'm going to do my best to summarize the recent changes to the Brown Act in a way that, that, that kind of simplifies them um, and is as easy as to understand as possible. Um, unfortunately, that's not the easiest thing to do because the new changes to the Brown Act are, are a little bit convoluted in terms of how they deal with remote meeting situations. So I'm going to start briefly by Jumping back to before COVID, um, when the Brown Act did have certain provisions to allow for teleconferencing, which includes teleconferencing, by the way, in this context, includes any kind of remote um, use of remote meeting technology. So it can include video conferencing, but, but it's called teleconferencing in the, uh, in the Brown Act. Um, so we had before COVID uh, provisions in the Brown Act that allowed board members or committee members to participate remotely for any reason, as long as a quorum of the board or the committee was present within the, uh, within the boundaries of the district and at, at the location where the board or committee member wanted to participate from, they post a, the, a copy of the agenda and make it the location open and available to the public. And the agenda itself has to describe what each of those remote meeting locations is. Um, so those provisions ha haven't changed. They, they still continue. Um, there's additional provisions that predate COVID that allow for remote meetings to be conducted under emergency circumstances uh, in a declared state of emergency. And those provisions still continue. With COVID, what happened is that um, Initially, we had a governor's executive order that modified the Brown Act to allow for remote meetings. And then we had AB 361, which codified some of those changes. And that's what we're operating under right now is AB 361, which allows um, board and committee members all to participate from remote locations um, subject to certain limitations. Um, those provisions are no longer going to be applicable at the end of February. And the reason for that is that the governor has indicated, and we don't have any intel to the contrary, we fully expect that the governor is going to lift the COVID state of emergency declaration at the end of this month. And when that goes away, the basis for continuing to conduct these fully remote meetings under AB 361 also goes away. Um, those provisions will still exist, but the basis for these meetings will be gone. So now we get to the most recent change in the Brown Act, which is AB 2449, which was enacted in September and, and took effect at the beginning of this year. Um, 
AB 2449 um, retains some aspects of AB 361, and it creates sort of a new regime to allow that would allow board and committee members and members of the public to participate in remote meetings, but it puts a lot of red tape on the ability to do that. And in particular, uh, some of the red tape that I think may be important to the members of the board here include that there are only certain reasons why a board member can participate remotely. Um, and those are uh, de defined terms, just cause and emergencies. And I think to kind of cut, cut to the chase on what is not an emergency or just cause, um, business or personal travel wouldn't qualify for either, either of those categories. So if the district were conducting meetings under these AB 2449 provisions, or, or I'm sorry, partially remote meetings under the AB 2449 provisions, um, board members would not be able to participate remotely where they have business or personal travel or any reason that isn't one of the specifically defined reasons in this new law. Um, another aspect of AB 2449, if we're taking advantage of those new provisions to conduct remote meet, partially remote meetings, um, the quorum of the board has to be present in a single location within the district's boundaries. And there's also a, a bunch of rules that apply to what happens if the district were to um, experience a remote meeting disruption. Um, and one of the most significant disruption provisions is that if a board member is participating remotely and the board member the board member must participate by video, and if video is lost, which in our experience happens, you know, not infrequently because of various types of internet disruptions and so forth, then the board member can no longer participate um, uh, in deliberating on items on the agenda. So, um, there's more nuance to it than that, but I think that's kind of the, the short version of what it looks like to conduct a meeting under AB 2449. Um, because of the limitations and the red tape that go with the AB 2449 provisions, the administration, the district's administration committee in considering how to implement um, a hybrid meeting policy for post COVID, um, recommended, and this is the policy that you'll see in the board packet, they recommended an approach that sticks to the old pre-COVID provisions of the Brown Act that, you know, folks who've been serving on um, boards longer will be well familiar with, where, um, for example, if a board member is going to take a business trip, then you would tell staff um, where you're going to be for the board meeting that information gets put in the posted agenda, and then you have to post the agenda at that location and make it open um, to the public. So um, that's the approach that's been taken in the proposed policy that, that, that you see in the packet that's been developed um, with a lot of input from the administration committee. Um, a few other features of this proposed policy that I'd like to point out, and I'm just scrolling down to it now, if you'll bear with me. Um, this proposed policy would make, uh, would affirm that it's the district's uh, intent to make um, meetings accessible remotely to the public to the maximal, maximum extent practicable. Um, however, um, it's not, it, it doesn't sort of guarantee remote access for members of the public. The primary meeting location would be the district's physical meeting location. And um, because we're not using the more complicated remote meeting provisions of the Brown Act, if the ability, if the video broadcasting gets lost during a meeting, the district would not necessarily have to stop a meeting because the meeting, the physical meeting location um, is the primary meeting location. A quorum would be present there and um, the district has the opportunity to participate in the meeting from that location. Um, so the, 
remote access is being provided as a, a courtesy and not as something that the district has to have in order to proceed with a meeting. So I think that's important to understand about um, this proposed approach. Um, and it also contains a number of provisions related to staffs and consultants use of remote meeting technology, because of course the Brown Act doesn't dictate how staff and consultants participate in meetings. And so some guidelines have been uh, created around um, how that would occur in, in sort of the, the hybrid meeting environment. Um, and Rick may wanna speak to what the district has actually done to outfit um, the hybrid meeting room um, for use as we transition to this new approach. Well, we, we have been preparing um, two offices in our, what we call the Johnson Building, and the address is uh, 12778 Highway 9 in Boulder Creek, uh, which is uh, adjacent to Foster Freeze, uh, to have, uh, to go back in person. They operate the building just isn't large enough uh, to, uh, to conduct meetings. We are doing a, uh, setting up a hybrid, um, situation where we're using uh, Zoom technology uh, for uh, to have these meetings uh, videoed or uh, teleconference as well as um, in person. Uh, we will be setting up a um, YouTube account uh, so we can uh, store these videos uh, online. Uh, we hope to be ready um, for the March 2nd board meeting, we're still getting parts of our technology in due to supply uh, chain delays. Um, we will be putting out some information to the board with the Wi-Fi address of that building and um, some other instructions before the uh, the board meeting in March. So there's, there's more to follow um, on that subject. If it would be helpful, I could actually walk through quickly through each element of the proposed policy, but I um, would share uh, a mark, would that be helpful? Um, I believe, or I've read the policy and uh, the board has had, in my mind, sufficient time to look at this also. I'd rather um, solicit questions from the board at this point, since I take it that we've all read this at this point. So. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, hear first from uh, Jamie Ackman, who chairs the admin committee and has been heavily involved in developing this policy. So, Jamie, you want to comment on it further or any questions? I, I don't have any questions. I think Gina has done a, a good job of laying out the reasons for um, the recommendation. Um, I uh, you know, I would also say that as a as a board member who um, joined the board during the COVID pandemic and so under the emergency authorization rules, it would be helpful um, just in terms of like, okay, process. Uh, if there was something, Gina, that you or or Holly might send the board members just for like, okay, so so now you have to be away somewhere. Here's what you need to do. Contact Holly and give her these three pieces of information, um, you know, whatever, just like sort of a, a clear, you know, step by step so that we, when it does come up, we don't miss anything important that would make our... Um, ourselves legal in terms of hosting the meeting, but, um, you know, we can cross that bridge down the road. So I, I support this. Um, I think, you know, hopefully it'll be the best of both um, situations for our community and that they'll still have hybrid access, but we'll have a little more flexibility as board members. Okay. Um, I like your uh, request to Holly for a procedural description of uh, what we need to do, but also when, uh, since we understand that this is supposed to be uh, an alternate address if, if we intend to have a meeting from there, needs to be part of the agenda packet. So if you can lay that out for us, Holly, as board members, so that we can see that. Uh, okay, uh, Jeff? 
So, so to follow up on Jamie's suggestion and your uh, passing that on to Holly, uh, I, I think this should be something like a checklist rather than a long bunch of long legal paragraphs. You know, step one, step two, step three, check, 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 and get it done. Um, I'm not particularly happy with any of it, but that's uh, neither here nor there, and I will follow through with what needs to be done. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, since I believe you were involved in developing some of this last year. Yeah, I mean, uh, given the fact that our legislature is still struggling to enter the 21st century um, and apparently doesn't travel for business, um, I, you know, when Gina laid out the changes that were made to the, the Brown Act to support, you know, remote meetings, it became very clear that that wasn't something I could support, given my um, upcoming work schedule and travel and, and the like. So I was advocating for exactly what um, has come to this board, which is the ability for the public to participate remotely, as I think that is the key aspect of this particular policy change. Um, you know, so that so that people don't have to leave their house if they don't wish to and drive, you know, half hour each way uh, in the dark, usually going back. Um, to be able to attend the board meeting. And I, I think that is a really important part. And frankly, to me, it is even more transparent than what the original Brown Act was attempting to do. Um, so so that's why I, I'm definitely in support of this. Um, I, I, I've, I, because I just find it so quaint. I mean, when I was in Germany participating, for some reason, not a lot of people there wanted to come into my room and, and engage in a board meeting. I was, I was shocked, actually by that. Um, <laughs> they probably couldn't read what I had posted in, in the hotel. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's it's just quite um, quite comical, actually, yes. uh, in that regard. I did have one comment, though, I wanted to make about this. And that is, while um, I'm okay with a policy um, that says that, you know, the meeting is at the board uh, facility, um, and that's where the quorum is. If we were to lose power or broadband or what have you on a very significant issue, like for example, a rate increase, proposed rate increase or budgets or something like that, um, I would advocate for a delay in the meeting unless there was some really super urgent reason why we couldn't have a special meeting or, or reconvene at a later time. And I think the policy gives us the flexibility to be able to do that. And, and I would definitely support that kind of a um, decision that if the board were to make that in, under those circumstances. So, um, yeah, let's, I can hardly wait to see the room. Uh, Rick, thank you for your guys doing all this work. I think I'm the only board member that actually has participated in a meeting. So it's going to be very interesting to see all of you. It was four different people when the last happened. So it's going to be great to see all of you in person when, uh, when we do get back together. Okay. Gail? Uh, I, I share Bob's horror at AB2449. I mean, when I read it, I was just dismayed. I was like, who are these people? They must all live in metropolitan areas um, and don't understand any of the challenges that those of us out in the hinterlands might have or um, have real lives. Um, but I, so I, I want to compliment the admin committee on coming up with what I think is a very sensible and clearly written policy that I can support. I, I just would add that I think it's really important that we did this because if we'd actually followed AB 2449, I think that most of our public members on committees would have quit because the demands um, for them to you know, have to come up with that basically there was some terrible family emergency as an excuse to be remote would have just been um, too much. So I, I think that this is a, a good compromise and hopefully most of our public members can continue to um, participate um, 
because we value them. That's all. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bob? On the public member side, though, I think there's still the need for a quorum locally. Yeah. It's just it does give people that can't make it for whatever reason the, the flexibility to do Absolutely. that. Yeah, and, and also, Gina, too, just to make you feel better, too, Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency's attorney had exactly the same reaction that you did, mm -hmm. which was this was quite um, quite not a workable policy to the changes that were made uh, for, quote, hybrid meetings. So we're not alone in our disdain for this new law. Jeff? So um, I, I should make myself clear that I my earlier dismay about this whole thing has nothing to do with the committee or Gina's understanding of it or any of that. Yeah, um, I my beef is with the legislature and uh, like Bob, I, I have conducted global meetings around the world. Um, I've hired and fired people across continents, um, managed teams that were global. <laughs> Um, this, this is just ridiculous. I think those guys up in Sacramento have, they've never been out of town. They've never been out of Sacramento, I think. I, I don't know. Anyway, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. Okay. Jamie? I, I just have to get on my soapbox for just a second and say that uh, I work for, in my professional life for a joint powers authority similar to the Santa Margarita Board. It's It's different jurisdictions. We have 37 board members oh. that we oh. have to get together in person starting next month. Whoa. Oh, oh good luck. That's a 19 oh. quorum. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, so uh, given the um, what distasteful nature of what we're being presented with, um, I don't see any way around this. Uh, I'm not happy with it either, but uh, this is what the state has presented us. And this is where we have to be going at this point. So given that, uh, I'll put the motion out there before I solicit comments from the public uh, that we adopt the attached uh, hybrid remote meeting policy uh, attached to this memo and staff included in the forthcoming update to the board's district policy manual. I second it. Okay. Uh, do we have any uh, comments from members of the public? Okay. Alina Lang. Go ahead. Hi, Alina Lang, Boulder Creek. I uh, was we'll sit on the E and E committee, so I had some questions. You know, COVID isn't over, and actually, COVID cases here on the rise in Santa Cruz County again. And I'm just curious what safety measures have been put in place to protect those that are participating in these meetings or committee meetings, board, both of them, like ventilation. You know, appropriate room size for the number of people that are going to be there. I'm just wondering what steps have already been taken. Rick. Can you address that for us? Rick, you're muted. Elaine, I'm sorry I didn't hear you. Could you repeat that, please? Did we lose you already? Nope, no, no, I just had to, I muted, so I had to unmute again. Oh, I, I was just asking, since COVID cases like are again on the rise here in Santa Cruz County, like what safety measures have been put in place to protect uh, the people that are participating in the meetings, like ventilation or room size or anything? Oh, gotcha. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the room is will be quite large for, um, for committee meetings. Uh, the desks that we purchase are, uh, I do believe they're two and a half, three feet that we can separate so you're not bunched up. We feel that we'll have good separation. Uh, there's uh, at least two doors for ventilation. It's a big room. In that sense, you know, with masks, um, I don't think there'll be any issues. And obviously we'll take the disinfection type precautions. Um, 
it is a, a much, much larger room. It's pretty close to the same size. I don't know if you've been in the Santa Margarita room at Scotts Valley Water. Um, it's a pretty good size room, especially for committee meetings. We'll have social okay. distance. Okay. Thank you for that comment, Rick. Um, Mark Dolson. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. So I appreciate this too. As a member of the admin committee, there was a question that came up at our last meeting that I'm still a little unclear on the answer to. So I wonder if, if Gina could just clarify this. As worded, it, it leaves open the possibility, at least the impression of one, that a committee member could be part of a quorum while attending a committee meeting from their home within the district's boundaries. And I'm wanting to understand whether that's in fact the way we will operate or not the way we will operate. Um, thanks. Gina. Mark, did you want me to? Yes, Gina, please. Okay. Um, so the Brown Act does allow when we're using the older Brown Act provisions as we are with this policy, it does allow for the possibility of multiple locate, that the quorum could participate from multiple locations within the district's boundaries. Of course, each of those would have to be identified as a meeting location. And the policy as it's written right now does say that uh, board and committee members would be expected to attend hybrid meetings in person unless arrangements are made to participate telephonically. So I think that the the presumption would be that board and committee members would participate um, in person from the designated physical location within the district's boundaries. But the Brown Act does leave open the possibility that the district could designate multiple locations within the district's boundaries from which the quorum could participate. It gets a little unwieldy, but it is possible. Okay. Uh, Jamie, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I, I think that it's a it's an interesting loophole. I mean, I, loophole maybe is the wrong word or, you know, but it, it, um, I, I would want to know how much, I guess I don't really have a sense of like how much extra work and impact does this place on, on district staff you know, when people are participating from disparate locations, because, you know, I, I, I want us to have the flexibility to do this, but I also don't want to make it a burden. And um, so, you know, I, I was sort of leaning towards the interpretation of the policy that said that a quorum had to be together in person mm -hmm. if, yeah. uh, you know, but a, an individual could be elsewhere. Um, so, Mark? Mark, you're muted. Um, um, we're getting reverb from somebody that either has a radio on in the background or a second computer. Could the participants please mute uh, your computer devices or however else you're listening? Thank you. Sorry, Jamie. To cut you off, but it was difficult to hear what you were saying. Uh, Jamie, I'm sorry, I think it was me, and I'm sorry because I there was something else going on in the background. Oh. So I think that that was coming from me, which is why it was difficult to hear. So do you okay. need me to repeat that? Um, I, I heard most of I, it, Gail. Yeah, I heard it. Well, I I heard it, and I guess I I would um, dispute what Jamie said a little bit because I think we need to make it clear that we've written the policy in a particular way. Um, and to say that your expectation is that people will, uh, you know, must show up and you have, must have a quorum in one place is, I, I think that the way it's written is the way yes. we interpret it, which, and we may say that um, we hope that uh, there will be a physical quorum in a room in the Johnson building, but that's not at all required by this policy. Um, and so I, I just want to clarify that because I think especially for the case of committees, um, that may 
you know, just it, it may not be the right thing to do. I guess the other thing I would also say is that um, I, I would say let's adopt this with under the understanding that um, it can be changed. You know, if we, after a number of months, find out, you know, Holly says, oh, my God, this is just way too, um, you know, burdensome or unwieldy to keep track of different people in different places, um, you know, we can come back and, and revisit this. But I, I think the way it's written right now is is good. Well, yeah, I also want to mention that I think it's great that there's flexibility for the staff. I've been an advocate right from the beginning of my time on the board that it should be um, that that if there are circumstances staff wants to participate from home, that they're able to do that. I know people have families and home lives and evenings they want to spend uh, maybe doing other things. And I, I'm glad that this is in there. So big thumbs up. Okay. okay. Thank you. And I want to reiterate what Gail said. Um, the policy as written is what we're going by. Um, I understand the intent of what we would like, but it's the policy as written that we will be going by. And if necessary, we will make adjustments down the line. This is going to be a learning curve uh, since there's only one board member now who's been in public board meetings. Uh, Bob. Uh, and it was different back then. It was yeah. all in one room. Well, I, I attended a lot of those meetings crammed into um, that little room. Yes, you did. But as board members, one has. So we will be on a bit of a learning curve, at least for the next three, four months, I believe. And if we need to make adjustments down the line because of difficulties that we see or other flexibilities that we see that could legally be built into this, and we'll go there, but we're going to have to take that experiences first. So, okay. Uh, given that, uh, James has his hand up. Oh, uh, okay. I just had a question about the alternative locations that are identified on the agenda when this does happen. Are they okay. required to be open to the public? Those yes. Locations? That's what I thought. I thought that might want to yes. clarified. Yes. Thank you. Reckon C. Okay. Deutsch. And the so you policy. can go to Bob's house whenever Bob's at his house for a meeting. <laughs> I won't be at my house for a meeting. I might be in Germany. Reckon <laughs> <laughs> C. Deutsch. The, I believe that the policy does state that, that locations have to be posted. Okay. Uh, we have a motion in front of us. It's been seconded. Um, Holly, can you take a roll call vote on this? President Smalley? A very begrudging yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackerman? Yes. Director Foles? Yes. Director Mayhood? Aye. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, moving on then uh, to the next uh, item on new uh, business. We received uh, a notification from LAFCO uh, from the Santa Cruz County uh, LAFCO Commission regarding an election for the regular member representative. Uh, the election uh, will be conducted by mail. Uh, there are two candidates uh, for the regular member. Uh, and the representatives are, are Rachel Lather from Soquel Water District and James Joseph uh, Gallagher from the Pajaro Valley Healthcare. Uh, we need to vote for one, and the ballot is due no later than 4 p.m. on March 24th. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, so, um, is the motion asking us to? designate a representative to put this vote in and that representative votes or are we uh, to authorize a voting designee to execute the ballot on behalf of the two members is what I'm reading. Uh, 
Holly? Um, that's yeah, correct. Cool. So we need to decide who, what the vote is going to be, and then the designee has to, and we also need to designate someone to do the actual voting. So there's two parts to this. I see. Um, what we're okay. going, who you choose to vote for, as well as who is going to sign uh, the um, desig, who's going to sign the ballot. And I think, um, I believe that can actually be me. I, okay. I can be designated as the person that sends in the vote that you make. Okay. All right. Well, then, uh, any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Jeff? I don't know either of these people, so I have no idea. Okay. Uh, Gail? Uh, I move that we uh, cast our vote for Rachel Lather, given that she's also part of a water district. Um, and that Second. we designate Holly as the person to send in our vote. Second to that. The combined motion, it sounds like. Okay, not two separate one. It's a combined okay. motion. Um, yeah, I agree. Okay. I agree, Gail. I, I, and you know, Rachel is going to be a good um, representative. Um, okay, uh, Jamie. I was going to nominate Rachel if nobody else did. So it sounds like there's a broad consensus. Um, I concur. I don't have any questions on this. Um, I, the motion has been put out in front of us and seconded. Holly? Public. A public comment. Arizona. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, any members of the public to comment on this? I see none. Okay. Holly? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Fulz? Yes. Director Mayhood? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Uh, moving on to the consent agendas, agenda. Are there any items on the con consent agenda that anybody wishes to have pulled? Seeing none, uh, we will move on then. Uh, district reports, uh, the district manager's report. Uh, I have uh, two items, two personnel items to uh, report to the board. The first one, we want to welcome uh, Devin Jackson uh, to the district as a new environmental planner one. Uh, Devin comes from the uh, city of San Jose, where he was a uh, environmental specialist. And he's also had past employment with the Santa Cruz Mountain Trails stewardship. Uh, he was a trail project manager there. Uh, Devin has a Bachelor's of Science um, degree in environmental management from Cal Poly. Uh, my second announcement is that we've done an in-house promotion of uh, Jesse Guyver, a 10-year employee to the Water Quality and Treatment Manager. Um, Jesse's been with the districts, like I said, for 10 years. He was a uh, treatment supervisor. He's been in that position for almost a year now uh, since Nate left. Uh, he has a T4, D4, and is a uh, certified lab manager. So those are two uh, changes that have been made. Yay. Um, well, I'd like to say welcome to Devin and to Jesse. That's great. In particular, the certified lab manager, that's not an easy achievement. So congrats. And that's great to hear, Rick. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, department status reports. Um, questions on these, uh, if any. Uh, Bob, you want to start? Yeah, Mark, and did you want me to run through all of them across all reports? Yes. 
I don't have that many, but I do yes. understand the reports. Yeah, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, for, yeah, first question was on engineering report. Um, any uh, news on the Felton Heights uh, situation? I, I can, uh, I, I'll, let me answer that, Josh. Um, we have been in communications with the property owner and we're looks like we're scheduling a meeting a week from uh, today to tour the new site with the property owner and we're moving uh, ahead working uh, on that. Yep, definitely keep us uh, up to date. On right. the Huckleberry Island, Maine, uh, any issues with getting the easements? Well, there are two different uh, sets of easements, if you will, that we need for that main. One is on the uh, south side of the river on the Howard property that they've already agreed to. We are finishing up the paperwork there on the bridge and the easements across the two breed parcels. We are still working on those. Okay. Let's see. On the Stewart Street main break, has the county finished their um, evaluation of the uh, extent of the slide and provided that data to the district? If they have completed it, they have not provided data. But you don't know if they've completed it yet? That is correct. I do not know. Have they given you an indication of when that might happen? They have not. Um, turning to the environmental report on the DWR sustainable groundwater management grant program, the application submitted in December of 2022. Carly, I'm sorry, what were the uh, target projects for that one? I believe that date might be wrong. It should have been 2023. That was the recent grant that we had the board approval resolution for on the tank replacements. Um, okay, gotcha. Okay, that's mm -hmm. what I, that's. I thought that one of these was that okay, and the other one that was just submitted the 2022 urban community drought relief grant uh, projects for that one. Yes, maybe let me take a look there, Bob. Um, that's the one I actually think I was referring to. So, what was the 2022? It says DWR Sustainable Groundwater Management Grant Program application submitted in December 2022. Is it a dupe? It might be. It might honestly have just fallen in there because that doesn't seem correct. The most recent one we submitted was the one that the board approved the resolution for recently. Um, through yeah, the UR. That's, why I was, that's why I was asking about it because I didn't recall. I thought maybe I was just having a senior moment. Um, okay, no worries, no worries. Um, next one on there, Sand Hills Habitat Conservation Plan. Please, can you tell us that this is done? <laughs> It is not done, unfortunately, no. but we do have the drafted chapters. We're currently waiting for internal staff review. There's just with all the storms and everything going on, it's been difficult to have operations staff and uh, Rick's time to dedicate to that review of that document. Uh, but as soon as they complete their review, we'll be bringing it to the environmental committee. So it is it is not held up on the consultant side at this point. Oh, good. good. That's, that, that's the main thing that I was because this has been going on for what, seven years, eight years? Right, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a good amount of time. It's been a long time. Um, and we, we could definitely use that, um, that report. Um, okay, and then on the, just a comment on the operation um, production comparison, uh, and this I think probably is for Rick, but you know, it would be, it would be really great if we could get a, uh, at least for me, my opinion, it'd be really great if we could get a report that had the production and sales for a month on the same page. Um, and it would even be better if it was on the same graph, because I know we have a forecast and an actual, and if we could put production on a, a line on it, that would just be phenomenal. Um, that way I can just kind of look at everything at once and see how we're doing uh, relative to uh, uh, the production versus sales. Okay. And I think that is it. Thank you very much. Okay. Jeff, any questions? No comment. No questions. Okay. Gail?
Hearing none, seeing none. Jamie? Okay. All right. I don't have any questions at this point yet either. Uh, James? Yeah, I'd just like to make sure everybody noticed that the flushings, uh, district wide flushing is going to begin, and that, that was highlighted in the report. Just want to be sure everybody realizes that. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, with that, uh, oh, I do want to comment that during the closed session, and I don't think we reflected that at the beginning of this meeting, we have nothing to report on the closed session item that we discussed. So the public can hear that. Okay, uh, with that, I think we can adjourn this meeting without objections. And I do have to say, I'm sorry to say that this is our last official by Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. Maybe. You, you never know what Gavin's going to do. And you never, uh, never uh, know. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. okay. Good night, folks. Good night.